Dzień dobry ponownie. Witamy po przerwie. Mam nadzieję, że też, też się wszyscy wzmocniliście w czasie przerwy. Zaczynamy drugą część spotkania. Myślę, że będzie nie od rzeczy powiedzieć. Jeszcze raz przypomnieć wszystkim uczestnikom, że mamy spotkanie jest dwujęzyczne. Wprost na platformie Zoom mamy wydarzenie po angielsku. A jeśli ktoś chce and if you wish polsku, to see us and hear us in Polish, YouTube, please go to the YouTube channel. The, the link to that channel is in our chat. That was at the beginning of our meeting. And through that YouTube channel, you can uh, see and hear the Polish, Polish language transmission of our meeting. So let's not wait any longer. Now we will have a next presentation. It will be by Jan Dovgeło, who is a representative of the Sustainable Architecture uh, branch. He is with us in the meeting today in the mirror room of the Warsaw branch of the uh, architects um, society. The topic is architects for the climate and more. We will have an opportunity to learn about the initiatives that are related to our topic uh, are, are undertaken. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm a Warsaw-based architect and the sustainable architecture a team of the Warsaw branch of architects uh, society. I deal with the regenerative architecture focused on natural materials, which means circular constructions. And the core of our meeting, of, of our work, is to use this kind of materials that do not produce waste. When we produce them, we don't emit CO2, and quite the contrary. The regenerative aspect is that they absorb CO2. I will tell you about the architects for climate, but it cannot be discussed without starting by uh, speaking about the so-called of um, sustainable architecture. We are all of us three here are members of it. It was set up in 2018, and we have 24 members. As Piotr was mentioned at the beginning, when the circle, this team was set up with only a few people, there was an issue of how to name this um, team. We are all aware that the balance in our world has been really strongly uh, disturbed. So maintaining this, the, the word sustainable is, doesn't really make sense because we are not sustaining what is now. But we decided that regenerative is not recognized and understood enough for the time being. So we are the team of architects that deal with regenerative architecture, but the name is Sustainable Architecture. Our members have really diverse experience from various industries. We have active architects that design uh, ob facilities and objects on a very uh, many different scales. We have consultants, lecturers, academic uh, professionals, uh, landscape architects. And as you can see, we started from having a common understanding of what we want to deal with and how 
the architecture should look like. And at the beginning, we have set up three main goals. The first one was our own development, sharing experience and sharing knowledge amongst ourselves. The second goal was to raise awareness and popularize the tools and methods um, within the architectural um, professionals. So we wanted to address people who speak the same language. And the third point is cooperation with everybody else, all the organizations, or all, all the other stakeholders. We experienced a quick development. We have uh, engaged ourselves in various activities. Some of them were uh, spontaneous. We took part in the uh, climate strike of young people. We started to print publications as the organization or uh, just the members of our organization. We organize workshop, workshops for, uh, for, for the citizens, for those who are interested. We started with workshops that had a goal of um, talking about particular topics that people wanted to address. They chose the topics. Then we started to organize various meetings and lectures and workshops. Uh, during the pandemic, the pandemic we met online, and despite what we might have thought at the beginning, it helped a lot to share the knowledge amongst ourselves because it turned out that the online meeting make it really much more easier because we don't need to go far away to meet. So we were able to meet more frequently and people present their activities, whereas up until then, we only uh, were able to deal with the current matters and organizational matters. So each of us does a bit different things. I encourage you to join us. One of our activities that we've undertaken recently, and it's more organized, it's a series of meetings, it's about architecture of climate crisis, it's available online on YouTube and it is on our website as well. These are meeting, um, meetings that are related to very different topics, we usually invite three or four or five people. And the topics are um, carbon footprint, Polish uh, implementations of, of restorative architecture or circular um, architecture facilities from cradle to cradle. What is our most known actions, probably, uh, there's somebody lurking uh, there um, behind the, the, the TV, okay, so this is hashtag architects for climate. It, we were inspired by UK um, Landscape architects declared climate and biodiversity emergency, but we only transferred it to our Polish uh, conditions and circumstances. We wanted to make it our own so that is more understood and more up to date. We started with a declaration that is available on the website of Architects for Climate, where we have listed the main points. It is compatible with 17 goals of sustainable development by the UN.
To jest taki podstawowy dokument i wytyczne. To jest basic document and basic guidelines about what are the directions that the world should take in years to come or now or should have taken for a long time already. Very many points uh, are related to architecture and uh, urban areas. One of our first conferences in Zodiac uh, was about these goals. The architects for climate well, we promoted those ideas by just trying to talk uh, the as many architects into it uh, as possible to present themselves with this um, logo and the hashtag Architects for Climate in signing our declaration. The goal was to popularize the um, directions that we want to take and encourage people to really think whether our work is in line with those points. Uh, our organization works with very many other organizations. We're open to actually anybody. They are private companies, universities, cities, um, local governments, municipalities, Polish Association of Ecological Constructions, you are a local partner uh, at a program, One Click LCA, that's an, an application for measuring. Just give me a second, please. To compare the carbon footprint of buildings, it's really useful while designing. We also cooperate with initiatives such as Architects Climate Action Network in a sister organization, Polish organization, Architects Declare Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, which is even closer to the British version and the, the international one as well. Plus, of course, the universities uh, own uh, university, Warsaw University of Technology and others. Two of our members present here are in the management board of the Warsaw Association of Polish Architects, which is important, and they are putting this topic forward there. We can see the results, the results um, that I will present shortly. Before the lockdown mainly, but even still now, we have been cooperated with the um, architectural studio Zodiac. It is available for us. It is really helpful to be able to organize our workshops and conferences there. Now, we get a help uh, from Warsaw institutions uh, when we organize the online events. So we cooperate with the local authority of the municipality of Warsaw and we're present in various meetings and conferences. We are in touch with um, the Office for Protection of Air and uh, Climate Protection. As Piotr said at the beginning, the members of our team prepared criteria for assessment of architectural implementations uh, to analyze the climate responsibility 
of for the award, architectural award of the uh, president of the city of Warsaw, and there's a special prize additionally. Right now, there's a third edition with this prize. We have judges that are on the jury, jury members, and I hope that someday it will not be a special prize, but it will be one of the main designing a criterion. People from our organization have um, elaborated uh, the criteria and and assessed the buildings for that prize. We also we took part in the first citizens' uh, climate summit in Warsaw. And in this panel, there were recommendations for the panelists, and eight out of ten were accepted by the president of the city of Warsaw for implementation. Now, the balance is not enough, as I think, personally, and so some of us share this standpoint. What we need to do is to think how to restore the world that has been really destroyed a lot. Thank you very much. I think I've speed it up a little bit. That's great. You're, you've used your time perfectly. Thank you. So we know now if participants have want to participate, to cooperate with us, we're open. So you're welcome to come to us. And now a member of uh, our team that has been delegated to a different country, Ms. Uh, Ursula Kośmińska, I would like to give you the floor now. Uh, the presentation is on uh, design in a circular in economy or in circular uh, or circular design in general. Good afternoon. I don't know if it should be like that because I hear both languages at the same time. I'm going to speak English, so maybe I do not need the translation, the interpretation. Because I cannot concentrate because I hear both languages. According to me, you can start your presentation in English and uh, the interpreters will manage. Okay, I just hope I don't hear, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, but I, okay, I'm just doing it in English. I will share my screen. Just if someone can tell me if you can see my screen. Um, as a as a full screen, do you see it? Because I don't see anyone waving or in the chat. So if you can just tell me if you see it, then I start. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Helpful. Uh, okay. So my name is Ula Kuzminska. I'm an architect and an assistant professor uh, in Aarhus School of Architecture. Uh, and a member of SARP um, Warsaw, in Warsaw, because that's where I originally come from. Uh, and today I will be talking about circular design, architecture, tools and incentives in Denmark. Um, and um, I, I, maybe mm, I would like to talk about Danish, um, Danish circular design, because Denmark can be um, treated as an inspiring uh, place to look for circular solutions. Uh, as there is a lot of going on um, in that topic, and I don't know if I can okay, I can minimize that, that you don't see that. Okay, uh, probably already had a lot of um, introduction to the uh, circular design and the restorative design, but I will try to be very fast in this kind of general theories behind. By uh, but when we talk about circular economy, we talk about this new restorative and regenerative economic models, which synthesize such concepts as natural capitalism, industrial ecology cradle to cradle, biomimicry, uh, functional economy and blue economy. And to kind of define circular economy shortly, we can say that circular economy transforms products and services to eliminate the problem of waste Urszula, and its negative. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
Tak? Mamy w tej chwili taki problem, że przez chwilę było widać twoją prezentację, natomiast w tej chwili... I think we have a problem. We have seen your presentation for some time and now we do see only black screen. So maybe if you could share your screen again so that we can see your presentation also. Teraz widzimy w widoku... Now we can... Now we can see your presentation. Now? Nie, znowu jest czarny. Okay, so I can't do full screen. I don't know why. Then I will keep it like this. Okay. It's not that nice, but I will just keep it like this. I don't know why. Uh, when I enter full screen, it turns black, <laughs> but uh, Zoom doesn't like me. Uh, but I just get back to what I was saying. So when we talk about the circular um, economy, we talk about um, this concept that transforms and eliminates waste. Uh, it uses renewable resources and closed material loops, as well as uh, it derives from social and environmental capital. It depends on systemic innovation and non-standard management systems, and it aims to decouple socio-economic growth and the consumption of non-renewable resources. And it's very shortly uh, based on the main three principles, which are design, out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and rege regenerate natural systems, as for example, happens in um, uh, cradle to cradle uh, kind of concepts. And when we talk about Denmark and Danish context for circular economy, we obviously have to talk about construction and demolition waste. And um, it is estimated that 20% reduction of resources consumption in Denmark and Norway could result in a decrease in potential gas emissions by almost two, ton million, two million tons yearly. And const construction and demolition waste generated in Denmark um, equals around almost three million tons per year. And Denmark recovers 90% of construction and demolition waste, but the circular materi uh, material use rate, which can be defined as this kind of actual reuse um, in Denmark is only a little bit more than 8%. So there is still a lot to do uh, here. And when we talk about the context, obviously we have to talk about the socio-cultural context. And in a way, Nordic countries has this certain favorable conditions for I think sustainable development in general, but also for circular economy. And here are some numbers from the report that was published um, now two years ago in 2019, which says, for example, that 46% of Danes are familiar with the term circular economy. 88% of Danes are in favor of the idea to reduce their own overall consumption. 65% of Danes are open to the concept of adequate tax shifts. Um, they also show positive attitudes towards repairing, um, recycling and secondhand purchases. For example, 32% of Danes repair the items, 21% Danes bought secondhand items more than 10 times in 2019. I think all these numbers uh, kind of show that in a, in a way Nordic societies, this, this most economically equal nations create certain preconditions that are conditional for full implementation for the circular economy. And surely they, they create a favorable context. But when we talk about the context, it's also very important to talk about the policies and incentives. Um, and there is a lot happening recently um, in relation to circular economy. Um, um, in Denmark, the first, I think, like, quite relevant action was that, uh, the fact that uh, in 2017, um, the advisory board for circular economy was established to increase resource efficiency create new markets, circular business models, promote green deals, new standards, and also update building regulations. Um, a, a year later, um, there was a strategy um, uh, uh, created uh, that um, um, promotes circular economy, it's national strategy for circular econ economy, which uh, promotes recirculation of materials and products, as well as um, um, it aims to develop adequate design market for waste and reused goods um, and also promotes gaining more value from buildings. What is interesting is that this strategy is um, the only, I think Denmark is the only country in the Nordic region which, which has the strategy for circular economy that addresses construction sector. Other countries, they do um, also work with circular economy, but not so much in the construction sec sector. And then there are other kind of in incentives. For example, Danish public procurement uh, favors the purchase of uh, circular goods and services by the public sector. Um, Danish Design Council um, runs this project on circular design um, that aims to integrate circular strategies 
for example, circular supply, resource recovery, life extension, sharing platforms and products as service. There are also some competitions which are promoting circularity. Um, for example, the one run by Real Dania. Real Dania is this big philanthropist um, foundation that, uh, that actually invests a lot in sustainable architecture. And there is this competition called Circular Challenge that um, granted 130,000 euros to develop circular solutions. I think it was from 2018. And there were projects, the awarded projects, for example, um, co concerned uh, creating waste from biomaterials or uh, rethinking um, timber downscale, uh, downcycling, sorry, and uh, also producing new, new construction system from i think waste roof uh, roofing waste um, there are also some regional programs for example circularity city project uh, in central denmark region which runs since i think it started in 2012 and this project aims to not only develop new urban solutions but also rethink existing value chains it promotes material recycling digitization modular fabrication construction uh, it also Mm, kind of wants to develop new materials and construction methods, uh, as well as mod, uh, uh, kind of mo very interdisciplinary models for collaborations that involve, for example, municipalities, architects, research institutes, and tech industry. Uh, but also, it promotes new uh, business models that um, that rely on circular supply, resource recovery, life extension, sharing platforms, and product as service. And um, when we talk about incentives, it's obviously also important to talk about money <laughs> and uh, how the architects who are wor working with circular architecture here in Denmark um, get the funding for research. Uh, it, there is, first of all, there, is, there, is, there, there are foundations which support um, innovative, sustainable architectural solutions, and there are grants that the architects can apply for. Uh, an interesting uh, example is this CO2 house project run by Real Dania, which I mentioned before. Um, it's the project that, um, for example, um, funded the upcycle house by Lenar Group. So the first uh, building which was testing how to reuse waste in the single family house. Um, there is also there is also a lot of funding and research that is happening in between, uh, in, col in close collaboration between architectural practices and academia. And maybe the, the, the projects worth mentioning are, for example, Rebeauty, Nordic Build Component Reuse, which was uh, developed by Van Kunsten when they created certain um, kind of scheme for reusing uh, waste, which, uh, which was also aesthetic and environmentally um, sound and there are also there is also a very interesting um, tool material pyram pyramid which is uh, which is this um, interactive online tool that offers an overview overview of the co2 impact of the materials in the construction project and that's that's a tool developed by van kunsten and sinark at kdk so royal uh, academy of fine arts in copenhagen and there is also there are also different models like for example GXN, which is a part of uh, the big known I think architectural office 3XN. And GXN focuses very much on research and especially interesting they have uh, research on material innovation and also creating circular um, circular materials. Um, and I think they are more resilient in a way that they are using some surpluses from uh, from other projects to fund this kind of research. At least to some extent, <laughs> um, and then when with some examples, I want to show some examples what for, from what is currently built. But before I do that, I just wanted to say that this Danish circular architecture is actually using all kinds of uh, circular strategies. There are obviously buildings which are um, the examples of adaptive reuse or material reuse, but there are also buildings designed for disassembly. There are buildings which are designed according to the theory of um, this reduce, re, uh, reuse, recycle, or, or according to building layers. There are flexible buildings. There's buildings which are using cradle to cradle materials to some extent, uh, but there are also buildings which uh, create new or develop new circular business models as well as new co living models. And then I show some images. Sorry for all this text before, but. Uh, 
Um, first example is the adaptive reuse. Um, example is the Constable School apartment in Copenhagen, which is the renovation of the of the of the um, post-industrial building for a new um, student housing, affordable student housing in Copenhagen. And what is interesting in this project that is it's that uh, this is a kind of a reasonable adaptive reuse, which obviously had to conform with all the energy requirements, which I put it up here. But uh, it is this kind of adaptive reuse that only um, use as much, I would say, construction action as uh, as as it was necessary. So, uh, for example, the the interiors are left pretty raw. There is there is a lot of reuse of existing substance. Uh, to minimize the carbon footprint. There are also examples, uh, quite a lot of examples of material reuse in architecture and the good office to look when someone wants, is interested in that is Lenai Group uh, in Copenhagen because they do work a lot uh, with and finding new ways of using, um, using reused uh, materials. This is an example of uh, using reused bricks which are locally sourced in Carlsberg uh, from Carlsberg Brewery. Um, which is a huge development now ongoing in Copenhagen. And this building is now finished. It was pre-corona time photo, uh, but it's now finished and looks pretty good. But this is an interesting example because it kind of treats reused materials and prefabs and creates easy, um, um, like maybe easier way to implement them in architecture. Another example by Lena Group is Upcycle Studios. It's, a, it's an example of material reuse, but also recycling because there is recycled concrete and we used uh, wooden frames and wooden offcuts. And these buildings are also designed for flexibility. They have open plan and section, which allows um, them to be used in different ways. There are, I think, housing units, workshops and offices, um, and people use it diversely. There are also buildings designed for disassembly and also um, very focused on this kind of co-living. Uh, concepts and this good example is Elisbjerg Hill housing here in Aarhus uh, by Van Kunsten Architects. Um, this is the first, I think, designed for this assembly building in Denmark of that scale, mm, uh, and it's all made on, in tim uh, in timber. It's a timber structure where only foundation and I think staircase is made in concrete, but everything uh, everything else is um, is slab and column timber structure filled with CLT cassettes uh, also with this kind of untreated wood to facilitate future recycling. It's also interesting because it's obviously a housing, affordable housing project, uh, which has a lot of shared, uh, shared function, uh, functions. So promotes this co-living concept. Another example of design for this assembly is a single family house, Villa Nord, uh, Villa Wood actually, not Villa Nord, I made a mistake, in Copenhagen by Nord Architects. Um, it's a building that it's uh, made also of CLT, but C it's CNC cut CLT panels that are um, creating this um, this single family house, which is actually also questioning uh, the footprint of the standard uh, Danish Danish single family house. It's much smaller than what they usually build, uh, and it's also designed for flexibility. And there are also different uh, examples of um, this co-living project. So thinking about shared economy uh, in terms of social sustainability and also a very nice and awarded a lot uh, uh, project is this Friendly Housing Plus in Copenhagen by ONV Architecten, which is an affordable housing for Danish students and refugees. So the aim of this project is to integrate um, the refugees and the Danes. Uh, in, by creating this uh, mixed, uh, um, ah, sorry, I said that, um, that, create, that, 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 that um, by creating a new co-living model where the Danish student lives with the, uh, with the refugee and shares the living room, but also shares a lot of spaces in between. It's also a building which is all made in this kind of CLT prefabs, which are easily installed and can be easily also disassembled. And I think the last project I should show is the is a pretty known project, but maybe not successful in everything, uh, but and also has a lot of weird, <laughs> uh, weird solutions. But it's the uh, Green Solution House by GXN, which explores this thinking about circularity um, in this kind of holistic manner, uh, because it explores explores different 
systems, biodiversity, indoor climate, you know, etc. But it also creates a new um, circular business model, which um, is based on the monetary revenue to develop new sustainable solutions. So it's in a way self-financing financing, financing a future um, um, solutions that can be incorporated in that project. And just to conclude, I hope I'm keeping time, <laughs> but um, currently built Danish architecture um, applies diverse circular design strategies and rethinks existing value chains and business model in construction industry and de develops new cross-disciplinary organization of architectural offices, as well as um, research projects for new uh, circular solutions and, and tools to facilitate circular design. It creates new co-living models and also reuses locally sourced natural and discarded materials, uses modular prefabricated reversible systems and closes um, local energy waste, water and food uh, loops in building design. And all these actions are possible and are supported uh, by the government uh, and private entities. Um, the existence of policies and diverse regulatory and economic incentives promotes the transition towards circular economy in the construction sector and um, surely favorable socio-cultural context and pro-environmental education encourages circular design. And maybe last one comment I would add is that it sounds super uh, bright and, that, and there is a lot that is happening, but it's still not a mainstream architecture and circular architecture is not what is mainly building in in Denmark. I think thank you. That was that for me. I stopped sharing the screen. Thank you very much. Another very interesting presentation. If I may just add just like Ursula showed the building resource rose when it had the bricks that were taken from the Carlsbury Brewery demolition disassembly. Well, we may say that an important feature that shows up when we use the circular economy principles in architecture is the necessity to change the paradigm uh, in aesthetics. We change because if we don't, if we keep maintaining ourselves in this aesthetic paradigm when that we see in the majority of the magazines where everything is high glam, lavish and brand new. To carry out that transformation, we need to transform this paradigm as well and be ready to have those aesthetic changes, uh, aesthetic um, principles changed as well. Rebeauty is another publication that was mentioned. I recommend it highly. It's really inspiring. You may find the link to Rebeauty in that presentation that we've just seen. Thank you very much. The next presentation is by Anna zawadzka Sobierai, architect. Um, she will be talking about natural building case studies. Examples are from Poland, from our region. That's why it, I hope, I think it will be even more interesting. Good afternoon. Just as Piotr uh, introduced me before, I'm one of the people that are active in the uh, sustainable architecture team. I'm in the management board of the Association of Polish Architects, and I'm dealing with the natural architecture development. Together with my partner and uh, my business partner, Jan, who was talking about uh, Architects for Climate hashtag. We are practitioners and we have architectural practices. We teach at the Warsaw University as well about talking with students about the climate crisis and the community. My presentation is about natural building. 
Ale chciałam zacząć. Y... I'd like to start. Teraz, o, dobrze działa. Chciałam zacząć od miejsca materiałów naturalnych stanowiących właśnie budowę budownictwa naturalnego w cyrkularności. I jest to cykl biologiczny. Dużo tych high-techowych materiałów plasowałoby się w bardziej wysokoenergetyczne, wymagające większej energii włożonej cyklu technicznym. Przetwarzane, albo jak najmniej przetwarzane produkt używany na budowie, a następnie po okresie użytkowania po prostu ulegają różnej degradacji, wracają do ziemi i odżywiają się, które sprzyjają kolejnym promote um, the fertility of soil and they promote new generations based on, the, on organic qualities. In the pyramid of materials that was um, mentioned before, natural materials are at the base of the pyramid. That's the whole spectrum of the materials. It, um, there's wood in various forms and applications from the raw timber to the products that require more, invest, more substances or energy drewno klejone czy wełna drzewna. My pracujemy też z takimi mm, as, um, prostymi materiałami. Process tak, wood like wood wool. Słoma, We work with straw, clay and bricks. Tym, w tej piramidzie that are on, to widać, um, on mają ujemny ślad węglowy. Uh, they have negative tutaj, no, to trzeba by um, prześledzić, ale tak CO2 tak footprint. Nam, uh, drewno, uh, drewno i słomę. I so we have here the uh, słoma, wood and straw. Jest stosowana w konstrukcjach drewnianych straw is used jako, for wooden materials uh, as uh, wooden construction as insulation. It, It is a waste in agricultural production. It is not used in architecture, but it is already made architectural um, Uh, processing it does not need um, an energy and after the a time of uh, when the life cycle of the building ends, it may go back to nature. With Jan Dorgiało, we are active in the Polish Association of Natural Buildings constructions. It is with less people than our Warsaw-based SARP branch. But that's a group of architects, producentów, inwestorów, inwestors, jak również pasjonatów. Um, and people that are passionate about it. Celem jest po pierwsze wymiana wiedzy, bo od tego się zaczęło i poszukiwanie The purpose of this um, association is to share knowledge. Ten years ago when we have set up this association that was a brand new thing in Poland. Our efforts made it more popular. We have organized various conferences and meetings, including international ones and workshops. We dealt with the research of, on the natural materials. We are trying to promote good practices and our um, Our efforts to achieve circularity and to um, use the negative carbon footprint materials are an example of that um, tendency and strategy.
No i skupiamy się na tych materiałach naturalnych o European Straw Building Association and we focus on the materials that have simple production process. What is being built in Poland in that um, a trend in that uh, quality? I've added the wood. That's not a full slide because the wood, as understood in the classical Polish um, and understanding, is uh, the brick house uh, with um, uh, structural elements that are wooden. We want this to be quick, cost-effective, simple in organization of, um, of the construction. And the purpose of that is not to have only the uh, niche use of that um, technology in Poland, but to have it more popular. The advantage of them, of those buildings, is that we may have more um, benefits from that than from the materials that are not certified yet in Poland. We have prefabricated framings from the wood wall. Now, certification in meeting all the uh, parameters and requirements allows us to build, for instance, the kindergarten technology. The technologies that we want to develop further are presented here. Straw, which are uh, straw prefabricates that are ready-made panels in a wooden frame and that they are filled with straw. And the spectrum of materials is wide, but it is a niche used still. I've added hempcrete, which is a hemp with uh, um, lime and um, concrete with cement. Let me now discuss a project um, with MacBuild. We have participated in that project. It was organized by Veronika Siewiec and the Habitat Opole was uh, responsible for the implementation. It is a small house, but I'm showing it because there is a whole range of natural materials that we used. It was also an experimental design design to build a community around this trend. The project was financed by crowd crowdfunding and then people who paid and contributed to that project could come to our workshop and build a house together. There were like 90 people, including a lot of students, so, so they, could had an, uh, they could have an opportunity to learn and leave uh, with a manual that allowed them to build a house on their own. And we shared as well the project in an open source. We have timber construction and framework. We have um, wood on the elevation and we have locally um, acquired clay that was used as... That it was, the clay was used as plaster instead of... Um, fundamenty, które, mm, które zrobiliśmy z uh, Having the foundations z made of uh, concrete, we used the big stones that were tak available ten, ten in the neighborhood. And this is how this small house was built. Projekt. We also checked through that project how we are able to go down with the cost of construction to have this house being built by the owners of the house if they can, if they wish. In the, these few slides, you can 
изолация с конопи, цемента, сломяна с цемен, My jako pracovně projektujeme a za designing studio we design family houses residential houses that's a house near Warsaw it has been designed těžkého dřevna z nové konstrukce vypouněné heavy wood And there are bri straw bricks in there. The house is quite big, but um, CNC uh, prefabricates came to the construction site. It was filled with uh, straw bricks. And there are other um, solutions, such as the heat bombs, recuperation. It doesn't have certification, but it is actually in the passive standard. Installations are uh, screened, and the purpose was to acquire what would not suggest natural materials on the interior, but it could have been actually anything else. I myślę, że to zostało się And I think it was obtained for us. It was a ple pleasant part to uh, come to that construction site for supervision because when we entered the natural construction site, it all smelled with clay, straw, forest. There was no typical smell of chemicals or uh, drying concrete. This, uh, these are examples od naszych sąsiadów. From our neighbors. Wybrałam dwa takie dwie takie grupy z Czech i Słowacji. From Czech Republic and Slovakia. To też jest forma Baobaby Baobabs is the foundation and associations that are active not only in designing area or implementations area, but they promote this this kind of construction, they teach how to build those houses. There are many more uh, such houses in Poland, uh, in the Czech Republic, than in Poland. Uh, they are uh, single family houses. They are also made with uh, the straw prefabricates. We had an opportunity to be in a meeting uh, with Impact Hub Praga in uh, 2017. It was an interesting international meeting to contrast and to um, just share experiences of various countries and to get to know one another. Organica from Slovakia is a group that pilarizes the natural building and they build um, uh, residential houses or they do the finishing of existing houses and they do uh, the uh, clay plastering on the walls thanks to which the houses uh, gain a completely new microclimate and a completely uh, different health features. We met our uh, colleagues from uh, Czech uh, Republic and Slovakia under a project that is called Build Bake uh, Back Better. There's a group uh, from Albania, apart from those that I've mentioned. On that project, what we want to achieve in there is to implement natural um, construction methods in Albania, in a dual city that was destroyed by an earthquake. But that's a pilot study. It will be uh, ended with a small workshop and a guide will be published about natural building. We will train 16 people. Of, um, the participants will include uh, local government representatives, architects, uh, students. I think it will be just the first step. There's an idea to implement this kind of construction in Albania further. Albania wants to a draw from our experiences. And at the end, what are our experiences? 
Cały czas czujemy, że, że jeszcze All naprawdę time jest dużo do zrobienia, że te materiały, materials, one nie, nie tylko mogą zaistnieć jako lądek, one mogą być też łączone z zaawansowanymi technologiami, but they be used with very advanced technologies as materials used for buildings or with circular, circular buildings. It has negative carbon footprint, it is fully biodegradable, there are no waste, the materials can be produced or processed locally, so there's no CO2 in a transport, a footprint that is generated through this, this transport uh, process. What is missing? We're still missing a lot in terms of how known it is. Legislacyjne, brakuje norm, We're brakuje missing standardów. norms and standards on the legislative part. We as association of natural building, we've uh, kick-started this process uh, from the crowdfunding um, sources or, or from our association. And we have examined two important parameters, which is lambda, Natomiast and, oczywiście um, do zbadania jest the fire uh, resistance. Sporo. There are a lot of other factors to be still uh, studied. Do, do powszechnego użycia surowców organicznych i chcemy dążyć do tego, żeby móc te materiały We would like these materials to be able to be used in all kinds of buildings for residential housing, for public buildings, for multi-residential buildings. We need education and promotion. Ruszył program Poland, budownictwa drewnianego, program of, bo budownictwo uh, drewniane też takie jak naturalne. Because to wooden constructions, this is natural uh, constructions, they are not new, but still they are considered to be historic or museum solutions. And the modern, well, it's not so strong of a approach as before, but it used to be considered that uh, modern things are highly processed and high-tech. We want to go back to natural things, but in a modern way. We will also uh, make our colleagues from Albania know about that. We can see how the people from the Western Europe um, work. We have Upstro from, with leaders from France and with five other countries members. But there's a lot of educational and popularizational efforts there. So I hope that in some time we will be able to build just as here, this is co-housing from England, Lilac co-housing from Leeds, with a strong fabricate. Will we build our schools and public facilities like that? We are working on this. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Well, I don't know how to comment on that. Uh, there are a lot of excellent examples. And as Anya said, uh, we would really love to do more. And I hope that during the discussion we will be able to say a little bit more about how we can achieve more. Um, we don't have much time for discussion because we are uh, one presentation behind schedule. Uh, I would I would now like to ask Mr. Mateusz Poszaj Mazurek, um, who is working uh, at the Warsaw University of uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the architecture department. Um, he is uh, a designer of passive uh, housing, of, of passing buildings. He's going to present a presentation uh, on uh, the AI for regenerative uh, design. Uh, hi, uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here and to be able to present. I will speak in English. Uh, I think I can now share my screen or not. Um, 
Do you see my screen? Okay, it's uh, it's being shared. Okay, so uh, my name is Mateusz Poszej Mazurek. Uh, I'm a member of SARP. Uh, I'm certified passive house designer at Pierre Architecture, uh, where we are designing uh, sustainable architecture or regenerative architecture. And I'm also a PhD student at Faculty of Architecture uh, on Warsaw University of Technology. And today I will be speaking about the possibilities, how artificial intelligence and especially machine learning can help us uh, uh, develop a regenerative future. So uh, first, what is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for those that are not into this subject? Uh, generally, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we can uh, say uh, uh, these are algorithms that are uh, designed uh, to do tasks that recently were done only by human. But uh, machine learning, that's a subset of artificial intelligence. And uh, I have this great quote here, is that uh, machine learning uh, is the study of computer algorithms that allow computer programs to automatically improve through experience. What does it mean? This means that uh, this is a kind of black box uh, methods, which means that they are not uh, uh, specifically programmed to do a specific task, but uh, it works in another way. The algorithm learns itself looking at the examples of uh, what is right and what is wrong. Here, uh, that's just a simple example. If we would feed an algorithm with ex uh, uh, images of different animals and then label them, which are, for example, uh, this is a duck and this is not a duck, then uh, given enough, uh, examples, uh, the algorithm would, would learn itself how to predict uh, whether uh, uh, the example is such an animal or, or uh, is not. This, uh, these types of, uh, of methods require human to label the data so uh, that uh, someone uh, sits down and writes actually whether this is a duck or this is not a duck. Other kind of uh, machine learning algorithms are uns unsupervised, which means that we don't give any information to the machine and the machine uh, clusters the data into specific areas, into specific categories, just by looking at similarities and differences between them. So uh, this uh, seems maybe a bit uh, strange or uh, complicated, but uh, we actually encounter uh, uh, this artificial intelligence in an everyday life. When we use Netflix, YouTube, or social media, all those posts or uh, movies are recommended to us by machine learning systems that just learn from our previous decisions. When we use Google Maps to find a way home, uh, then this is also a similar algorithm. This also uh, uh, is used in mail, uh, spam filtering, the plagiarism detection in fi financial areas, and so on. But uh, we don't see a lot of uh, those uh, yet in architecture. And uh, the, the artificial intelligence is just uh, arriving uh, at, in every sector of our life. Uh, just last week, I have encountered uh, this new idea from the uh, Simpsons is that uh, they are considering whether maybe uh, they would drop uh, at all the actors, the voice actors, and they will just they would just generate similar uh, voice uh, automatically. But going back to the uh, architecture, engineering, and construction industry, uh, to our topic, when we are uh, looking at the connection between artificial intelligence and machine learning and architecture, we are actually seeing uh, something uh, like this uh, tag cloud. So this is mostly about smart, smart city, Internet of Things, and management. Uh, and I will show such examples, but I will show also uh, the new examples that are emerging that are not often yet talked about. So uh, the four areas that I will cover is uh, uh, with a few examples is building design, urban planning scales, data extraction, and building management. And going uh, through those examples, uh, first, uh, what I wanted to show, which is not uh, yet recently uh, directly connected to regenerative design, but uh, 
machine learning can, for example, uh, work for us uh, translating image styles or generating new images based on input from an architect or a designer and just generate uh, new images. Similarly, uh, there is a famous master by Stanislas Chalo from uh, Harvard, uh, who designed a machine learning algorithm that just generated floor plans and then converted them to uh, different styles like Baroque, modern style, and so on, uh, depending on the decision of the uh, person controlling the algorithm. But on such scale, and the building scale, there are already a lot of examples of energy efficiency estimation, both for design, the buildings being designed and for existing buildings. And those are typically are based on a lot of data from existing buildings and from simulations. Then the algorithm can automatically predict what will be the, the energy usage uh, in the next year, or what will be the energy usage of our concept design, maybe depending on the climate conditions, depending on uh, many other circumstances. But uh, we can also use those algorithms at bigger scales. Uh, here is a, a screenshot uh, from one of such uh, emerging algorithms. In uh, recent few years, I have begun seeing a lot of those. Uh, here, for example, uh, this is a SpaceMaker AI, that's a program that's using a machine learning approach to automate the anal uh, environment, environmental analysis. So uh, they are not actually being done on the computer, uh, the analysis, but the results are predicted by a trained machine learning model, uh, which makes them much faster and easier for, for the end user to use them. Similar approach here is uh, being proposed by uh, City Intelligence Lab uh, at uh, Austrian Institute of Technology, where, for example, wind simulations Tutaj are simplified. Wiatru, uh, ma... uh, the wind simulations, uh, I started uh, hearing my Polish uh, translation and uh, just stopped. Uh, so here is the wind simulation, uh, which is also uh, being done uh, with a prediction of machine learning model and not with actual uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation. But uh, those artificial intelligence are also used on much bigger scales uh, uh, in the data extraction area. Here's an example from MIT where they used uh, uh, the Google Strip view images to detect uh, what is the uh, actual Per, uh, perception of space according to the green areas, where do we actually see the green areas uh, in different areas of different cities, and then uh, cataloged it into uh, uh, a lot of data. But we also have uh, from uh, like a few weeks ago, uh, Warsaw City also published uh, their uh, greenery map, which was based on machine learning approach. Uh, different kinds of satellite images, images were used to uh, automatically detect the trees uh, in the city. Uh, here, for example, uh, a limitation was that uh, the crown area of the tree was to be at least seven square meters because for the smaller trees, it was uh, not enough uh, resolution to detect, de detect them. Similarly, uh, those approaches can be used, for example, for automatic uh, rooftop PV potential analysis. Here is an example how a machine learning model has been used to estimate the possibilities of placing PVs on different rooftops. That's from US. For building management for existing buildings, there are also many examples where machine learning is used, for example, to optimize the e. HVAC schedules, and uh, this uh, real example from micro Microsoft has shown that uh, it saves at least fifteen thousand of dollars every year, and it's based uh, on uh, occupancy data uh, and also on the uh, and prediction of occupancy and uh, climate conditions. This means that uh, the building can lower their energy use. Similar. Uh, 
Google is using DeepMind technology, their machine learning uh, algorithm to predict uh, uh, the weather conditions uh, and to estimate how much uh, wind power will be generated in, on, in order to recommend uh, how much to sell to the grid, how much to use and how to optimize this energy usage so that uh, uh, the energy is not wasted. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the last from uh, examples is a very interesting approach from WeWork, uh, where they used the uh, machine learning model to estimate uh, how often different areas of the office will be used depending on their layout. And then uh, they uh, make, uh, made a comparison because they asked also their design, uh, designers, the architects, to estimate. Uh, those numbers, and it actually appeared that computer was much better at uh, predicting how often uh, these real-time uh, office areas will be used than uh, human designers that work with those tasks every day. And now I wanted to also show one of my, uh, one, my example. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing a PhD uh, at Warsaw University of Technology, and I'm working on a building scale on uh, creating a carbon footprint prediction plugin, which is based uh, on a trained machine, le uh, machine learning model. Uh, so uh, the model works in this way that uh, I have made uh, more than 3000 simulations, energy simulations in Energy Plus, uh, saved uh, various information about those uh, simulations and also generated uh, these, the same amount of urban layouts and save the images of them, and then fed it to the machine learning model, which allowed me to train it to predict what will be the um, carbon footprint of a concept design. This can be used as a plugin in uh, Rhino, uh, and it means that a person that isn't knowledgeable about doing LCA analysis can also uh, use such plugin to easily estimate uh, how uh, small changes to the building shape, how uh, to the building shape, construction, uh, uh, etc., can influence the carbon footprint of a building. Uh, some uh, just uh, some interesting uh, facts from these simulations, uh, for example, she has shown me that uh, uh, when we are looking at the life cycle of a building, and at different uh, construction presets. Here, for example, the blue is a concrete prefab, then uh, the green is traditional concrete frame pl uh, plus uh, bricks. Uh, the orange is a uh, lightweight timber frame, and the uh, red is CLT. And uh, we, of course, would uh, think uh, that uh, the wooden versions will be uh, better, but uh, how uh, how can uh, are the lightweight timber better or the CLT version is better? And if we look at those uh, two graphs, we can see that actually, if we look at those um, uh, embodied material stages from the product material production A1 A3 and uh, material uh, the waste disposal, then actually the uh, lightweight timber is slightly lower carbon footprint than CLT. CLT shines, however, when we include also the D-phase uh, of the life cycle of the building. So uh, the CLT is much better when we include the circular economic potential, the recycling of the, those elements and uh, the reuse. And I also wanted uh, to mention that uh, the restore, uh, I have been part of restore training school uh, three years ago, the World Group 2 in Malaga, Spain. And uh, that was the place where I have first heard about uh, machine learning in uh, architecture. So I could say that uh, my uh, work currently really stems from this Restore project. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to be able to participate in, uh, in this project. Uh, you could see also uh, uh, the book mentioned that was Effect of the World Group 2. Uh, and uh, some early version of this tool has been uh, shown in this book. Uh, the most recent uh, publication from my project can be found on the Energies Journal webpage. Uh, and uh, 
to summarize, uh, now uh, we can say that data is the most valu valuable resource, but as architects, we typically not uh, still not to focus on how to use the data. And typically in every project, we are gathering a lot of knowledge again, and we do not transfer this knowledge between projects. We don't use the power of uh, big data and artificial intelligence. The famous companies that use AI uh, gather the data in different way. They can use this data and apply uh, to almost everything because this data is uh, more uh, decentralized. Of course, this is uh, not only uh, uh, the artificial intelligence is not only a good side. Uh, recently, uh, a big project in Toronto uh, has been uh, cancelled. The uh, Google was uh, a project backed by Google was uh, to, uh, to build a big smart city district, which would uh, have almost everything uh, helped by artificial intelligence. And actually, people were afraid of how much control we would give up uh, to those algorithms uh, that would decide for us a lot of things. So um, I think that architects need to find ways to incorporate, uh, incorporate AI in their practice, but not in a way that will replace our decision-making process, not to uh, really scrap uh, out of uh, this uh, design process. But uh, in the other hand, I think we should uh, try to use the AI to help us not to uh, waste time on many tedious tasks like uh, like setting up analysis, uh, designing uh, uh, non-important parts of the project, or solving things that can, uh, that are solved again and again uh, in the similar manner. For example, like the multifamily housing layouts. Uh, and that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mateusz. And uh, I think I'm not the only one, uh, or I'm not the only person that uh, is quite amazed by the possibilities that uh, we are not aware of, and that it's happening uh, already all around us. Uh, when one thinks about it more deeply, probably one could arrive at such conclusion. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation and uh, probably we will still have some time to, to have a discussion afterwards and to talk about some, uh, some things about this presentation or some phenomena that the presentation discussed. Um, before we go through to this discussion, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Katarzyna Wojda uh, to take the floor. She's uh, the ambassador of Living uh, Building uh, Challenge in Poland. And uh, Kasia is going to present to us uh, the certification system and uh, some characteristics which distinguish it from among other systems. Uh, thank you, Piotr. And despite the fact that I'm a Polish citizen, I will take the liberty to speak English. I hope you can hear me correctly. Um, as I, I'm honored to, to represent the Living Building Challenge and the Living Future Institute, uh, being the ambassador of it to Poland. Uh, hence, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking English. I hope that's okay with my Polish colleagues. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm honored to represent, that's my one of my legs, um, Living Future Institute and the Living Building Challenge as the program, much more than just the certification system, I believe, and I hope I will make you uh, see that in a minute, as this is uh, actually a nice closure uh, and also enhancing the message that Carlo Battisti said in the, in the morning, in the beginning of this conference, but actually we all need to start making positive impact, not just, not just seeking less bad solutions. And uh, throughout the whole day and all the presentation from the Restore project that is kind of a um, legacy of a living building challenge in a way, we can see that we, we have all the tools, we have all the uh, advocacy, we just need to get 
uh, doing that and to to take our stakeholders interested and like uh, my um, former colleague Carsten said uh, today it, it has to be looking at the um, um, challenges and tackle them not just uh, having a business investors uh, interest in mind but our all interest in mind and what living building challenge is as a program as an initiative is calling us to act to restore the health relationship between uh, human and uh, nature and it's been there for 50 15 years and i wouldn't be surprised that you haven't heard maybe of a living building challenge yet and i've been asking myself the question why and maybe it sounds too soft and too um, maybe not you know down to earth business wise thinking about restoring you know human nature relationship, but the last year in particular, the whole pandemic situation where we are in, I think this is the momentum that takes our attention back to where we came from in a way. And I think this is a perfect momentum for such conferences, for such discussions and for taking this action to restore those healthy relationships, to have this transformation that give us the living future communities that are, you know, socially just for everyone, not just for the chosen who have more money, that are culturally rich and that are ecologically restorative. And what is Beautiful and phenomenal about the Living Building Challenge as an initiative is that it, it has always been like a kind of a Trojan horse. That it's a philosophical approach to life and what we can do in our everyday life, regardless of whether we are architects, engineers, uh, people from the building sector, or wherever, healthy, wherever we are, whatever we do, that we can focus on doing something good, on contributing with the positive change. And Living Building Challenge has um, has been trying to define what is actually that is good, what does good look like, and how do we come with, you know, making this positive change and making this better, becoming the better version of ourselves and of the world that we live in. And it has this metaphor of a flower. Wiesz co, jestem na konferencji dzisiaj cały dzień, aż do 16. Jacku, I can hear you. <laughs> you can mute your microphone. Dobrze. Dobrze. before living building challenge is much more than just a certification program it has been like a philosophy approach to what we can do to, to get better it has a lot of advocacy tools based on data as Mateusz said data is the new oil and certification is just a kind of side effect of it in a way or maybe a um, catalyst teaser to those who need to be measured to become better in a way and I tend to speak about Living Building Challenge as a kind of umbrella to all the other certification systems that we know for now and that we believe more or less in them, um, being Briam, Lead, or Well, some of them focusing very much on the hard data from, from the building, uh, the others on what the building does to the person, to, to the human, to the use, uh, to those who use it and to the environment. And Living Building Challenge has it all. It's holistically approaching both uh, the building itself, what it does to people, what it does to their health, to their communities, to the society. And what is, uh, as I mentioned, it is, uh, we're using this metaphor. It might sound very, again, soft and subtle uh, when you think of a, uh, you know, developers, building constructors, and when you go and talk to them about building becoming a flower, that means rooting in a place, using, um, generating its own energy and uh, treating its own water, and yet being beautiful. And, you know, beauty is a criteria that is so hard to be measured and also maybe doesn't sound too serious to the business world, but think of it as especially looking back at the last year, we've been needing this spiritual um, heights and beauty as a designing criteria that 
kind of brings our spirits up. That, that's becoming an important element of it all. And um, those petals, the seven petals of the flower, of the building being as a flower in a living building challenge are more or less overlapping with many other um, separately uh, criteria of different certification systems. Of course, we're looking at the, at the place where, where the building is um, becoming to be uh, acting. Uh, it's important that I think the common denominator for living building challenge buildings is that the place has to become a better one because the building uh, is built there. And uh, it is measured via those seven petals, like place, water, energy, that businesses usually would say, but also health and happiness, uh, also materials that are also healthy and contributing to the health, equity and beauty. Very, as I said, soft and subtle criteria, but so critical those days. And each of the petals have 20 very specific criteria that needs to be met or that needs to be looked at when we are designing a living building, challenge buildings. I'm, I'd be happy to share more details uh, about that uh, later on. I'm just having, having five minutes more probably. And this certification has also different stages or different levels, but please do not look at it as the only as a only certification standard. It's a it's a way of living in a way. It's a new approach. It's a tr transitory to taking uh, action on a very holistic level. And I would skip those slides that are talking about the specific uh, certification criteria just to give you a hint. After those fifteen years, we have. 141 certified projects all over the world in different criterias. And some of them are in the process, some of them are registered. What is important here is that you register the project on the platform and then you can have access to all the valuable data that Mateusz has also mentioned before, how valuable they are. And even though you might not get there to the top and not end up with a certification, it's extremely crucial that you take the benefit of all this information of, that has been collected by the experts, that, that has been provided there by the researchers and engineers, and use it and reuse it again to do better. Like there was this uh, famous um, man on the internet after one of the COP, uh, I can't remember which one, the latest probably, conferences, uh, about a guy saying, okay, what if this whole climate change is a crisis is not real and we do all this good, you know, in vain. Let's, let's lose this approach and let's try to do better regardless. Uh, whether we get the certificate as a prize. The prize in itself would be that we provide better living conditions for us all and that we preserve the communities or build them, the communities that we're living in. Um, so it all sounds like a very pathetic um, slogans, you might say, or charismatic ones that should take uh, crowds, uh, awake up the crowds to, to do something better, to do good. And Everybody in this room, virtual room, probably agree that this is the time. Jan mentioned that the, the uh, UN 17 goals that we should be following a long time ago. We should have started. Um, and this particular in, initiative, Living Building Challenge, is also in favor or following that path as well and showing that this is the only way. I mean, we cannot, we, we, cannot, we cannot do differently. It should become business as usual. And I love, in particular, this, this graph. I know that Carla has been showing us this morning. This is where we are. We should be giving up the fact that the, the left part of the paradigm, that we try to do less harm. We need to go into the direction of making a positive impact, of contributing. Living Building Challenge has um, 
um, the, the experts, the, the people standing behind, created this fantastic um, comparison of a footprint and handprint that we leave in the in the society in the world. Footprint, we all familiar. We we measuring them. Footprint is something that you take from from the place, from the environment, from the society, and handprint is something that you give. And our goal here is to make our handprints, the, the positive impact, bigger than our footprints. And I think I would like to leave you here with the handprint idea and focus on doing something better in every next building that you will be designing or buying or building as a developer. My goal today was also to say a few words about a Polish perspective. Is there any um, and what are the challenges for living building challenge in Poland? I became the ambassador of this phenomenal uh, initiative uh, a year ago. And uh, I, my second leg that I haven't mentioned yet is that I'm also running an architectural studio called Blog Architecti. And we have uh, become a partner supporting the living building challenge. And we came, uh, we were happy enough to uh, encounter an investor who was conscious enough to kind of almost fall in love with the standard. and. Um, it's it's a it's an investor that is a developer and operator at the same time called Alkin Partners, and we are now designing together potentially a first a pioneer uh, LBC um, place space. It's a, it's working with the existing building in Jolibos and creating an incubator of uh, of uh, micro uh, co and um, co living and co working, and uh, probably we will not get there to the top. It's not certain yet, but everybody is so excited about the information we can uh, get and work with to do all we know within the limits possible there, because we're working with existing building to make it happen, to make the positive change, to make our handprint bigger than the footprint. I encourage you all, whoever is interested, to find out more about the Living Building Challenge or the criteria or the whole community to join us and you can contact me as you see at the mail here or via Piot or SARP later on um, and get get access to this valuable information and contribute to making the world a better place. Thank you. Over to you, Piotr. Dziękuję. Odbiór tak jest. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will repeat myself, which is not very original now, but uh, it is uh, very interesting and uh, it's something that uh, diverges a little bit from uh, technology, but it was very important. Uh, I think we have another half an hour for discussion and uh, I suggest that I will ask the first question and I will ask somebody to answer it, but I don't want to ask questions uh, to specific speakers, uh, but to discuss, more or less. Uh, to start off the conversation, I wanted to welcome Mr. Jacek Kisiel, architect and uh, employee of uh, the Bureau of uh, Climate Protection uh, in the uh, capital city of Warsaw, in the City Hall. I am very happy that we were able to invite you to this event and I have a question to you. For a long time we have seen this tendency that uh, cities or regions are leaders of changes towards climate neutrality, regeneration and all the things that we are discussing today. I think that Warsaw is a great example of taking over initiative by self-government authorities when 
national uh, authorities are quite resistant to change or rather don't want to declare some concrete goals or objectives. What is happening in Warsaw or what has already happened in Warsaw and how do specific programs or plans translate into the reality? So over to you, Mr. Jacek Kisiel, if you could answer the question. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. Thanks to it, I could get to know, uh, learn about a fantastic project which is quite close to the things that we will be doing in the city. Jeżeli jest jakaś rywalizacja między samorządem a państwem, to to powinna być jedna pozytywna rywalizacja, wzajemne popychanie się wspólnemu celowi. Chociażby dlatego, że głównym celem jest pozytywne the heating for the Warsaw is produced in the state-owned heating plants. So only a change that change of the way they, the heating plants function, the change that we reduce the emission uh, that is generated in the city, where we are dependent on the state decisions, our results will improve the emissions of the state and will improve, will contribute to the results of Warsaw. And we in Warsaw, we have this approach that the greenhouse emissions of the, of the state are divided into those that are generated in Warsaw and those that are generated through the specific activity of the local government, metro, city transport, street lighting and the um, city-owned buildings. That is why we have more power on the emissions that are strictly related to the activity of the city. And as one of the examples of a positive inspiration, I think, of the state, I can say about the Warsaw um, climate panel that was mentioned before. As a result of the uh, citizens' request, we were able to carry out a um, climate panel that was dedicated to renewable sources of energy and energy efficiency. SARP was one of the parties uh, in the panel and uh, provided several great recommendations that were accepted and they were approved. They were voted in and these recommendations became binding for the city. There were 49 recommendations. And in the context of what we are discussing today, I want to emphasize how important two of those recommendations are to us. One of them is the creation standardu zielonego budynku of a green building standard in Warsaw. I co jest bardzo istotne, ten standard zielonego budynku będzie dotyczył Zielonego 
uh, that we call business as usual, as if a climate crisis never existed. It needs to be changed very soon. We need to introduce the greenhouse standard as soon as possible. It will be applicable to newly built buildings, city, municipality, authorities need, need to be um, the role modeling party. Ale standard też będzie też And the standard budynków, will be applicable miasta, to other buildings and where the city has a more serious challenge. There are several buildings that require um, renovation or changes. And this modernization cannot be only a simple uh, activity of providing uh, insulation or more heating related um, economies, but it needs to address the water crisis, air quality crisis, crisis related to climate change. So this standard will be one of requirements that will allow us to put the, the city, push the city authorities towards good direction and set the trends that, would, that may be adopted by other local authorities so they may be a positive impulse for the uh, policy of the whole country. The second recommendation is very strictly related to the first one, is the energy passport kind of certification that would serve to check to what extent the new buildings or renovated buildings meet the requirements of the new situation in which we are. To what extent they are friendly to climate and they um, are favorable to our goals. These standards will be binding for the city authorities, but I hope that even if they are not obligatory to citizens, they may be considered by uh, construction building um, companies and development companies. I think that these are very promising perspectives and after this conference we may consider it whether it should be a standard of green building or regenerative building that's still to be considered. So communicative uh, goals and well presented contents. Let's just think about it well. Coming back to this topic that it's not just a simple uh, competition between uh, the state and the uh, city authorities. It's true, both the energy mix and from the point of view of the architect, uh, architect the regulatory reality makes us, well, kind of limited. We not only can uh, design buildings in the way that we want. Mr. Carsten uh, said today, green regulatory tsunami. So we may expect, I hope that we as a country, we will be able to adopt to, to mitigate the tsunami risk. So the number of regulations that are now being generated on the part of the EU mostly, and on the other hand, on the city side is so serious. What I mean is the recent developments the, the EU Bauhaus, the project related to the reconstruction of the economy after the pandemic towards, well, sustainable, regenerative. Now, 
It may not matter that much how, how we call it, but what matters is that all these movements will cause financing decisions. We hear from MEA that loans will not be granted to high, and I think correct, criteria, that it does not harm eco uh, environment in any point. So there is a requirement that at least at some points this influence needs to be beneficial. So what I want to say is that the reality of the regulations, regulatory reality, is something that we will not avoid national changes. By now, I don't really feel that we have a real influence on that. If there are consultations held, we may, of course, react to the proposals by the government. Is there anything that the representatives of the city would like to add or address or attack? We would like things to be speeded up. Let's give a, an opportunity to others to speak. We would like that to be done faster. But in the last week or two weeks, I've, I'm really surprised uh, with the news from the city authorities. There is supposed to be a cycling path uh, above the Vistula River and some uh, other big changes in the cities that we are looking forward very much. They are regenerative and they are a good example. They will not only regenerate the, uh, the city space at that point, but they introduce serious consequences such as, for instance, cycling investments not only uh, cause the rise in the number of people who decide to uh, drive by bike, but they, these people are healthier. Apart from that, Świętokrzyska Street, when we compare it to the current um, Aleja Jerozolimskie, that's a regeneration of local businesses, shops that are more available to the pedestrians than uh, to people that drive by car, and the bridge for the cyclists can just increase the um, movement between the districts of the city. I'm very happy with it. I would like to see more of these initiatives and to be implemented faster, but I really see it as a good step forward, and I see these changes as really positive. I also noticed this, uh, the, the wording of the tsunami. I think it is unstoppable. I think now the time frame for the city activities, well, I'm really happy that the uh, green building standard is being worked on and I hope it will be introduced as good practice, but when can we expect a real change in terms of the uh, procurement standards, uh, when we know what they represent now. The change needs to be wide in order for us to really feel the quality of the change. Jacek, would you like to say something more about it? When we are discussing the new projects, Bardzo istotny jest what is really projekt, important takim projektem jednak flagowym obecnej kadencji is the key nowe centrum Warszawy, nowe project centrum Warszawy, for the president, which is the city center. 
That's the project that uh, comprises of several smaller projects uh, to make the city center more uh, friendly to the pedestrians, to the inhabitants. I think this aspect of um, kickstarting and boosting the uh, commerce is a key uh, project. Green Marszałkowska Street, the street with streets, with cycling paths, where we limit the a space for the automobile uh, movement and we give more space to people and for cyclists. It is an amazing project that was really well received by the uh, people of Warsaw and we see a serious Wystarczy wspomnieć reakcje, mental change. Reakcje Let's just mention the reaction of the uh, Warsaw inhabitants when we were discussing the transformation of Świętokrzyska Street. It was widely criticized and people were wrong, really wrong to, to criticize it so much. Now they are uh, happy to have this street renovated. In, now, in terms of the green Marszałkowska Street, these negative voices are not heard so much. We see a positive reaction. This shows that the, in terms of infrastructure, there's really a lot to be done in the city. People in Warsaw and their approach, their awareness is like in the west of Europe. I can feel that the green standard for the buildings is being widely discussed by various investors in the city. People who Budynki, które nie są przyjazne dla klimatu, nie dlatego, że nie chcą, well, the buildings tylko dlatego, że nie, that are not friendly to the climate aren't because uh, people don't have the standards and guidelines. Tutaj, That's the role of the city and of the office for the climate policy to set up the standards. And both for the inhabitants and for the city uh, officials, they, these both groups um, undergo a change in, the, in their awareness and it goes much faster than we all expected. I wasn't even aware that you may evaluate it so well. As far as uh, awareness or uh, knowledge of uh, inhabitants is concerned. So I think that we are um, f further on than I would think. Uh, and uh, using this occasion, I would also like to ask Ms. Uh, Katarzyna Wojda, um, because uh, there are very different certification uh, systems, and I don't know that living, living building challenge is not only a certification system; is one it, it is among others a certification system, and one of the characteristics of it uh, is that uh, it also covers the quality after some time of building uh, use, uh, for example, after one year. Uh, so, to use, um, to get a positive assessment, a positive evaluation, we not only need um, certification of the project, but also after a certain period of time of operation of the building. So, we eliminate the thing that is present in very different certification systems, which is that after we hand over the building, we no longer look at it and we no longer assess it. Do you think that this requirement of assessing the period of operation of the building and evaluation of this period of operation is one of the obstacles to, to uh, well, investors participating in this challenge, do you think that's the case? 
Um, thank you for that question, Piotr, because I completely forgot to mention that a very important aspect of a living building challenge approach, that this is performance based approach. And this is absolutely true that and this is what differs the whole standard from all the other under its umbrella, as I mentioned, that you need to observe the building for minimum 12 months to even consider getting the certification. And uh, we, what has been changed recently, just to give additional incentive to investors to uh, brag about the fact that they are working on it um, when the building is already ready to use, is a kind of a letter or statement that you can or stamp called LBC ready, that when the project is finished and the building is built, it can get this stamp, but only after 12 months, it can get the release certificate. But coming back to your question, I don't think that this is the obstacle. I think that this, um, I partly agree with uh, Mr. Jacek Kiesel that Warsaw is uh, like uh, like New York in a way, in Poland, Warsaw is a, is a country in, on its own in a way, and it's totally different from maybe the rest of Poland that we conscious wise, awareness wise, we, we are almost in the uh, Western world, but uh, with the status quo, with what we know now about green buildings or sustainable approach. But living building challenge is something yet uh, scaling up like one of the great speakers before me, Yelena, I think was talking about it. We have managed to convince developers, investors, businesses to cons even consider thinking about the building differently, to consider certifying them after you know, finishing the project design. And now we ask them to squeeze themselves even more. <laughs> and they probably they are not ready yet. I mean, their, their paradigm shift in their minds hasn't yet um, come up to this higher scale. But I think it's, it's going to come much sooner that we even consider it now. And I don't know if it's sad as it may seem, or maybe that's, uh, let's take the look at the bright side of the whole pandemic situation. And everything that will be done now has to be done with a really thoughtful approach to really make this places a better places that to make, to, to make this criteria of creating a building, a society as urban space, that because of the fact it is created, it makes the spot, the place, the building, and uh, the surroundings a better place. And I think that's, that's going to be very easy now to drag crowds after this charismatic headline, because we all are seeking, you know, better indoor climates, better houses where we can breathe deeply with the fresh air, without the smoke around from the cities or we can we need those movements when going to work if we are coming back to a new normal and will be coming back to offices that it's great to be safe on bike on our streets so all of these things that are happening in warsaw now i i love them absolutely and i was maybe too ecstatic expressing it here and now but uh it is going this direction and whether, whether some of the developers like it or not, but I think uh, we, we need to stop thinking of a society as us and them and, and become more like a, where do we get the win-win? Why it is so important for the whole society to look at it uh, this way that, it, that it's a better place for all of us. So I don't hope closing my answer to your question, that this requirement that it has, that the building can be certified 12 year, 12 months minimum after its operation, that it will be a showstopper. I think it's just a new kit on the block and that's why maybe some restrictions, but uh, it will not be a showstopper to my belief. But I would gladly um, discuss it with other opinions if you, Maybe Carlo, you can share your experience with other countries because we will be pioneers in Poland with the with this standard. Hopefully, was it a showstopper in other countries? Uh, 
Hello? Hello? Okay. W takim razie Great. to pytanie trochę zawisło. Myślę, so, uh, this question was left hanging, really, uh, but we will still come back to it, probably. Uh, um, we don't have much time for discussion, but as far as presentations from the second part are concerned, there is a question either to Urszula or to Mateusz. Mateusz uh, talked something about um, what is crucial for the success of a development and it is important in the early project stage, uh, design stage, to make decisions which allow us to have a general um, direction as far as uh, creating the, the structure, the, the orientation, the direction uh, of uh, the building, the energy sources decisions, uh, as well as permaculture solutions, water management solutions. All these decisions should be made at the programming stage, at the concept stage. And uh, Ula, Mateusz, if you could answer this question, uh, if we have such tools at our disposal or if they are already somewhere there waiting for us, uh, what it looks like from the Polish perspective and from the Danish perspective. But please keep it brief because we don't have much time, but I do want you to take the floor. No, who should go first? <laughs> I can I can maybe briefly comment on that. I mean, it's true. It's uh, it's totally um, crucial to implement all these con concepts in the in the beginning of the design process. It's not something that can be added later on, and and that would never <laughs> end up in any sustainable or regenerative design. So it's something to to really think in the beginning. And there are tools um, to do that, but there are also still not enough tools. And I think it's also the matter of very much the matter of education and educating for, for this kind of approach. Uh, but also it means that the, the first phase, the design phase uh, is extended and someone has to pay for that. And as I was trying to show in my, my uh, presentation that the architects here in Denmark, they somehow try to deal with these extra costs <laughs> and they probably have a little bit better conditions in terms of all the funding which is available available here for architects from the state but also from private entities which are trying to support um, such solutions because it's very much the matter of know-how and having examples and case studies that it's also can be used uh, to convince the developers uh, for example, that it's possible to do this kind of things because it's very often, and I know that also from my PhD, which was more investing in the Netherlands and and German situation, that it's very often the the kind of barrier is that the client that doesn't want certain solutions or is um, or that doesn't believe that it's possible. So it's about building, um, showing examples that are built. That is probably the best way um, <laughs> to convince that. That's doable. And for example, Real Dania, this, this foundation that I was mentioning here in Denmark, they finance a lot of projects um, that are investigated different approaches. And, and that that way, um, that kind of uh, makes this, these projects to be um, like sustainable, maybe it makes sustainable goals uh, possible to be implemented quite early. But I'm also, I know that my presentation showed um, it very positive <laughs> what happens here and it is positive and it's inspiring to research Danish uh, regenerative design but it's still not mainstream as I said so it's still a, a practice which is a niche and there is a lot, a lot to, to do but Mateusz do you want to maybe jump in with talking about Poland? Yes uh, uh, if we talk about Denmark and then about Poland I think the answer will be obvious that uh, <laughs> It's uh, even harder in Poland. I think uh, if we look at the tools available for architects, uh, we need uh, more knowledge, we need more education. Uh, there are uh, some tools, uh, there is also a barrier of price. Uh, but I think uh, with time, uh, this will change. Uh, and 
as we will show the need uh, for such tools and for the regenerative approach, more and more uh, tools will appear because uh, this will also be uh, just profitable from the commercial point of view. No, I don't know if this answers fully the Piotr's questions. It's, I hand it to you. We don't hear you, at uh, least not me. No, no, I don't hear Piotr. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks, thanks a lot. Of course, uh, yes. This is this is uh, a full answer because you finished it with a full stop. But I think that as far as tools are concerned in Poland, uh, for specialists, for professionals, if somebody gets a finished product, um, an end product, which are used by an architect or um, as a member of a multidisciplinary team uh, who should, well, be working from the very beginning. Well, I think we are lacking such tools. We need such tools. We try to acquire such tools, but I think that we need uh, more of them. Thank you very much for this discussion. And um, if I may, I would like to ask last presentation for today. Uh, and uh, this is going to be uh, a presentation uh, from uh, Zagreb. Uh, this is a presentation uh, titled uh, Materials for Dissemination. And we are going to be talking about uh, materials which we need at the end of this project. So good afternoon and I would like to invite you to take the floor. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? And see my slides? I hope this is working. Yes, so my name is Jelena Blaitifer. Uh, I, I work at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Civil Engineering, and I'm here to, to really briefly introduce um, how we communicate the scientific output of the restore action. Um, the entire work on the communication and dissemination is coordinated by Daniel Friedrich, who is our restore science communication manager. Uh, but he is not just coordinating things, he's really doing a very, very large portion by himself. But uh, to go quickly, uh, I'm just going to give a few numbers with facts and figures about Restore, about the activities that were done over the past four years, about the uh, printings uh, we uh, produced to disseminate the results, uh, specifically some other tools that are available online, what the, the dissemination channels we anticipate in the future, so towards the end of the action and some even uh, beyond. So what is going to happen, um, how we plan to, to progress, how we want to uh, turn Restore philosophy into, into practice. And of course, in the end, invite you to stay connected with us. So the, the, the focus, of, uh, focus point of all the dissemination, dissemination activities is of course the Restore website. Um, and there you can find uh, all the information, general information about the conference, uh, about the, the action, but also specific information, all the deliverables, announcement of different events that are taking place and so on. So first of all, in the section about, you will see very briefly some, some numbers about the cost action. It is really a huge action. It, uh, it has 150 members from 50 countries both from academia and from the industry and from a very large number of different competence fields. So we have number 36 competence fields. So there, there are really a lot of professions working together, coming together in this particular action. Uh, the research work itself was done by five working groups which were working in succession. Um, then uh, an important activity within, within uh, Restore Action 
was education through five academic academic training schools. So for each working group, there was uh, 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 there was a training school. Uh, for industrials, there was an industry workshop. Uh, through scientific missions, uh, there was interconnecting between universities. Then um, there is a funding of conference participants through ITCs, also funding of journal publications through OEA grants. Uh, there was one important uh, initiative um, in, in compliance with what is the, the, the focus and what is the topic of the action. So what we try to do is to, to offset, uh, to, to provide carbon offset for all the travels that were done in the action itself. And then, of course, all the information uh, uh, in, in the Restore event calendar also lists all the meetings that are done throughout the, the, the action. So there were five management committee meetings, there were 50 core group meetings, and really countless subgroup meetings. Many of them online, but significant number also uh, live uh, in person when it was still possible. Regarding the dis dissemination, each and every one of those working groups, which was actually producing the, the research, uh, ended its, its work, summarized it in a publication. So from the working group one, we have a publication booklet uh, called Restorative Sustainability from 2018. For working group two, there is a book over 400 pages on restorative design. From working group three, uh, restorative building and operations from working group four rethinking te technology and from working group five uh, it is the same intention to have a publication on scale jumping uh, once this is finished uh, what is still planned and what is currently worked on is to combine uh, the results of all working groups in a single book final book which will be over 300 pages uh, with 37 authors from 20 countries, and it will be published with Springer. Uh, one of the, the uh, outputs that I have mentioned, and I think uh, Roberto Lolini has also mentioned it in his presentation, because this is actually the output of the working group four, which you can find on our website under deliverables, is under deliverables, there are tools, and here you can find this atlas of solutions, which provides um, uh, links to, to, to specifically structured information on technologies that were employ, employed to improve indoor environment quality in 36 case studies from all over the world, not just in Europe, but in, uh, on other continents and, as well. Regarding uh, the news and how, uh, uh, how we try to cap the, the, the members uh, of the action, but also other uh, interested uh, uh, people uh, about what are we, we doing. There is a newsletter uh, connection, collection. Actually, this newsletter was published every month, so there are more than 40 up to date. In the newsletter, what is uh, given is the review of uh, the restore activities that were done before. There is a, a dissemination uh, list of disseminations that are acknowledging Restore, that are coming also from the, from the research in the Restore. Uh, there is a review of management decisions, so everything that was done up to a certain newsletter, but also what is planned in the future. So announcements of planned Restore activities, paper calls in journals, congresses, member nominations, and so on. Um, the, the action is coming towards the end, but we are still planning to, to go uh, uh, to, to disseminate for a while. So um, uh, if you are not yet subscribed, please go to, to the uh, Restore website, so eurestore.eu, and there uh, you, you can subscribe to it. <clears throat> what is further in planning? Uh, first, the, the printed book, which will be called Restory, Managing a Cost Action as a Project, uh, which will actually uh, give more details on how to manage a project like a cost action. Uh, remember, uh, I've, as I said in the beginning, there, are, there is really a large number of members, many, many countries, and most importantly, many different professions. Um, it will give the project presentation, it will give a chronological overview of, of activities, but it will also give the lessons that, uh, the, that were learned from the action. The other initiative is called Restored 2030, a city following Restore uh, philosophy. 
so the idea is uh, 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 of, the, of this particular output is to facilitate applying regenerative knowledge, tools, and outcomes from Restore. So the idea is to, to, to have a dissemination package with training and workshop guidance material, which could support schools, which could support academia and practice. All the outputs are available under deliverables. They are free, freely available for use. So it includes books, graphics, videos, presentations, many different stuff. For academia, it might be quite important that most of these documents that are freely available are scientifically citable. As I have said, we are coming towards the end of the action, but the Restore website will be further updated. We will post uh, uh, the most important news always on the landing page of the website itself, with links then to the, to the appropriate uh, other places. We will, uh, there will be papers, Knowledge and Restore, there will be Congress announcements, there will be notifications on planned joint research projects further. And to see how we can put this restore philosophy that uh, there was a lot of talk about today, how we can really turn it into a practice, just a couple of proposals for practical applications of those outputs that I have uh, presented. So first of all, students can, for example, conduct technology assessments from the Atlas of Solutions. There are very nice case studies there, and maybe uh, some further work on it can be done. Lecturers can create their course script with contents from the uh, five working group booklets and the subsequent uh, uh, entire book, which will uh, unite everything, uh, which can then be used as an inspiration for industrial managers to really reorient their business. Project managers can take into account the experiences from the Restory book when planning their activities. Universities can expand their teaching concepts with elements from Working Group 5 booklet. And public authorities, politicians, and humanists can draw inspiration from the planned Restored 2030 book. So I invite you all to stay connected with Restore. You can always contact us uh, through, the, through the email or keep in touch on the Facebook, Twitter. Uh, also, we are present on the research, uh, research gate. So that is all. Uh, I tried not to be uh, too long. Um, and I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. I do not see any questions. If questions are asked, I will know where to address them. So Thank you very much for your presentation. It really seems that it is well accessible and uh, well available, well communicated. Before the conference, when I was looking at the website, I saw that a lot of time is needed to actually read the valuable information that are published. We are heading towards the end of our meeting. I would really want to thank everyone. I want to thank all the guests and all the speakers, all the meeting participants and the team that um, made our transmission, our streaming possible. It has been a challenge for all of us because we have done that for the first time, but we really made, uh, I think, a, a good job. There were some small um, disadvantages, uh, some minor mistakes. I think it all went well. I do thank the interpreters and the office staff from the Warsaw branch. Just as Yelena said, I invite you to follow our website because we are planning a Polish streaming of the event. We are planning to put these parts on the websites of our uh, society. An attempt to sum it up, I want to tell you I am really happy that it took place. We need this discussion and 
I know that there are these discussions here on the chat that will, I'm sure, be continued. We didn't touch upon a few things in our discussion. I think we didn't speak a lot about uh, how these uh, regenerative uh, solutions or themes um, should be uh, implemented. We didn't speak about existing buildings. We didn't uh, speak about uh, those uh, protected buildings, uh, the heritage buildings. And I think that these are issues that have to be talked about. Um, there are more of them. I think that there is uh, one another remark uh, to finish off. Uh, this conference is taking place uh, in uh, during the epidemic uh, and uh, Ms. Yolana also talked about the epidemic and about uh, um, ending the epidemic and what it is going to look like afterwards. But the, the reaction to the epidemic by the people is quite it's quite optimistic uh, because in a situation of such uh, deep reaching changes uh, to avoid some uh, ominous scenarios, I, I think that we know uh, how to change our functioning and that we can change our approach and our mindset. We only need a good impulse. Within a few weeks, uh, our lives changed completely and it still goes on. So this adaptive capacity of human beings, in spite of all the negative uh, events connected with this epidemic, is, uh, is a message of hope. Um, but um, are we going to be concerned with the climate catastrophe as much as with the epidemic? We'll have to wait for it. Uh, this is all on our part. If Carlo Battisti wants to take the floor at the end, I would like to ask him to to uh, to do it. Um, we didn't plan for it uh, in our program, in our schedule, but if you want to take the floor, please do. If not, thank you very much. Thank you very much.